Hi everyone, I'm Nathalie Lebar. I'm the manager of a generative uh, coaching training and consulting company, which is called Chrysalis. And we work in both worlds, the world of business and the world of personal development. And today I have the huge honor to welcome Dr. Stephen Gilligan. So thank you, Steve. Thank you for Pleasure, being with, with us today. Yeah. And we have the chance to organize a generative trend certification in 2022, and it starts in January. In Paris. So, yes, in Paris, <laughs> in, in person. And so um, I have uh, a few questions for uh, French people about generative trends. And my first question uh, is, um, as a psychotherapist, a PhD, author, trainer, could you tell me more about your background and about generative change work? Well, that's a pretty big question for yeah, somebody it from is. an Irish culture. Uh, I'm from San Francisco. I was raised in a very Irish Catholic, violent alcoholic family. I went to Catholic schools, all boys Jesuit high school. I went to, did my undergraduate in psychology at University of California at Santa Cruz, where I was in the very first Bandler and Grinder NLP groups, I met people like Robert Diltz. Um, and um, also during that time met uh, Milton Erickson, the, you know, the legendary hypnotherapist who was a psychiatrist in his last six years living in Phoenix at that time. I did my graduate work in cognitive psychology at Stanford University. Um, and uh, since then I've been teaching, researching, doing private work, doing training with people. Really, I, I'd say uh, all the, the, the common core idea or question or principle is creativity, um, how to be able to support people in living positive, creative lives. Okay, thank you. And what about generative change work? Yeah, so, you know, if you look at sort of the evolution of my professional work, I went from NLP, before it was NLP, this is in the mid 70s, to Ericksonian psychotherapy, uh, to something that I developed after my father died, my daughter was born, mm -hmm. called self relations. And then this emerged into uh, what we call the generative change work. A good chunk of this work is a collaborative effort with Robert Diltz. Let's say we, we were classmates together 45 years ago. We've been working together for the last 20, 25 years. The word generative means to create something that has never existed before. Mm -hmm. um, there are a number of times where that's not only a, a nice thing, but it's a necessary thing. Uh, when people are at the end of an identity cycle, when a business is, is, has to regrow itself, when a person has to find a new professional identity, when a culture or a world culture has to generate new institutional structures like we have right now, as we've never before faced, this is the generative challenge. Mm -hmm. If we do more of the same, it's actually the problem gets worse. So what we're really looking at with the generative challenge is what kind of state can you help people to get into so that they can be able to meet some challenge, personal, professional, by going beyond where they've ever gone before. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Steve. Um, Steve, can you, you were a student of Milton Erickson and Gregory Bateson. Yeah. Can you tell us what they bring you in your work? Uh, everything. They're, you know, I've had, I've been blessed with uh, an, an amazing, amazing community of teachers. Um, I, I would, you know, I would put Milton Erickson as probably, you know, on my altar of altars, so to speak. Uh, and Bateson was one of the most brilliant, groundbreaking cyber, cyberneticians uh, of the 20th century. Actually, all of us, Bandler, Grinder, Diltz, Judy Delosier, and myself, got to know 
Milton Erickson through Gregory Bateson, who was a professor at Santa Cruz. And I took um, courses from him for like four years straight every, every quarter. I would go up to his home once a week for on Friday morning, have these breakfast table conversations about four or five of us. Mm. Um, he was an extraordinary, extraordinary thinker. Mm. In some ways, the the opposite in terms of their their just who they were as people, from Milton Erickson, who was the the most perceptive, intuitive, creative, uh, amazing uh, change practitioners I, I think the world has ever seen. Mm. So th those two are sort of in, in my core, what we call in the work community of saints are, are these people that are that are inside of me and with me at every step of my creative journey. Wow, thank you, Steve. Um, could, you, could you give me the definition of uh, the three intelligences hmm. that you are speaking about in generative trends? Well, as, as I said, I, I actually did my doctorate in cognitive psychology at Stanford in the late 70s and early 80s. Back then, sort of the mainstream idea of the mind was that it was a computer-like, verbal, rational machine that was housed inside the individual inside their head. More or less, that was it. Uh, we, I think, see the t tremendous inadequacy of that idea now. And we see that consciousness or mental process or reality being constructed, not just through the verbal, social, cognitive mind up here, which is really, really, really important, but uh, even in a deeper, more basic way, from the somatic intelligence down here. And furthermore, by the relationship communities and context that we navigate in. Mm. So when we say the three minds, we're talking about in the name of the cognitive and the somatic and the holy field. And what's really important if we're, if we're coaching creativity is a, a particular idea or an intention or a conversation really needs to weave its way through um, verbal mind, somatic mind, and field mind, if it's going to have any creative, particularly sustainable creative effect. Thank you, Steve. Um, so the name of the certification is Generative Trends. Uh, trance is not very known in France. So could you tell me more about trance uh, compared to hypnosis? Well, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a very awkward set of terms, I think. Uh, you know, I, uh, you know I, at Stanford, I was studying with Ernest Hilgard, who had the Stanford Hypnosis Laboratory. That's where they developed um, all these so-called standardized tests for hypnotizability. Um, I studied with Milton Erickson, who really shifted the whole understanding of hypnotic trance radically. Um, but I would say trance is this sort of universal consciousness where we, where we give our primary focus to sort of the dreamer or the world of imagination, mm. where everything is free. Everything's like in a dream or you're in some, some sort of just open creative process. Nothing is bound. Nothing is locked. So you can go anywhere from anywhere. Mm. Anything can turn into anything. So we see that as you might call it a, a quantum consciousness. And, you know, sometimes I, I give as a really prime example, the Monet paintings. Um, as examples of what we would call a quantum field or a trance field. Mm. And you see in those Monet paintings this beautiful visual example mm. of something that has no fixed figure ground. Mm. 
is sort of shimmering so that out of that great ocean, just about anything can, be, can emerge. Whenever attention tunes into that realm, that's trapped. Um, that, that realm is the balance and the complement to what, what we would call the realist or the conscious mind, which has a particular perspective and it has plans and sequences and understandings and frames of reference. Um, we, we see in creativity that we really need both. In fact, I'd say all the creativity models the last hundred years emphasize this conversation between the two worlds. So how do we know that it's time for quote unquote trance when our social cognitive mind can't get the job done? Mm -hmm. So we're going through, we wanna create something that there's a question that we're facing, there's an important um, relationship challenge and whatever we're doing isn't working. Mm -hmm. So we have a saying in, in American English, if you find yourself in a hole, stop digging. Mm -hmm. and what that means is stop mm -hmm. just doing the same old thing yeah. Yeah. and expecting a different result. So that's the time where we go back to, we say in English, back to the drawing board or go back into the ocean where we let go of all our fixed understandings and we take a dive to see what new understanding, new experiences um, can begin to emerge. That's trance. Now, their trance is developed through different uh, social rituals, if you will. Uh, so you're, one of your identities is, is as a dancer. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure there, there are certain dance processes where you're interested in just going into this open flow yeah, state yeah. Mm -hmm. that would be a sort of a trance ritual mm -hmm. hypnosis is that meditation would be another trance ritual mm -hmm. west uh, hypnosis evolved as the sort of the the mainstream way to develop trance and it's unfortunate because it carries this idea of one person controlling another person, yeah. of taking whatever new idea that you hope or new behavior that you hope a person will develop or they hope, and sort of programming it in, putting it in in terms of external suggestion. Yeah. We would say that's the problem, not the solution. Mm -hmm. So about 15 years ago, I just started decoupling those ideas of trance and hypnosis, even though it's 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 still sort of awkward. Yeah, yeah. To say we're looking to help people get into these creative dreamer imagination states without a rigid sequence or without being mm -hmm. controlled by somebody else. Yeah. So, so that's why we call it generative trance rather than generative hypnosis. Thank you. Really interesting. Thank you, Steve. Um, in a very short version, could you give me the different steps of generative trance? Yeah, so very short version. <laughs> But, uh, one thing I, I should just add to the conversation is there are many, many, many different types of trance. Symptoms like an addiction, a bad habit, a state of anxiety, uh, a depression, we call that a negative trance. You're, you're losing your ego control and going in to, to this world in, in which you, you don't have li linear structure or control. You're going to have your everyday just daydreaming trances. And then you have what we're calling generative trance, where you really can uh, uh, use it creatively for some particular positive intention. So to do that, the first step is before you start thinking about trance, is just get a good state within yourself. 
just settle down like any creative person does. Mm -hmm. Before the performance, you have to have some way of tuning, settling, relaxing. We call that opening the coach field or opening the positive field. Mm -hmm. Secondly, because we want to use a generative trance to reorganize, to, to transform, to give rise to new solutions in a person's own identity framework, we want to identify what are the important parts of the conversational system? What's the intention? What's the goal? Mm -hmm. What are the resources that we, we should call upon to help the person stay in a good state? And what are the obstacles that are integral parts of what's stopping or diverting the person? So in the second step, we, we identify the particulars. Then third step, we're doing, we're thinking of the base of trance as sort of a nonverbal rhythm, so to speak. So we're looking to go into breathing and repetition and just sort of these ways of, of moving a person from here, what do I do, what do I do, what do I do, yeah. to here, how can I feel that there's a deeper intelligence that I, I'm a part of? Yeah. That's step three. Step four is we bring in all these Erickson, what we call uh, the verbal techniques, the utilization, how to how to take everything a person's experiencing and weave it as part of the induction, how to find balances so that everything that's there is sort of coupled and balanced with, with an opposite, how to take every idea as in a divergent way that, oh, you could go this way with that, you could go this way, you could go that way. The, these are sort of the creative principles so that when we engage whatever we're struggling with, we can engage with it in a way that opens up to, to some creative path. So get comfortable, yeah. um, set the, the intention and identify resources and obstacles, get into the trance rhythm, um, begin to integrate all the different parts of, of the system that should be a part of that trance. Yeah. And then, then we get this rhythm going to the fifth step is integration, which is put all these, weave all these together and sort of a new mandala, a new identity map. Then step six, six and seven, we realize nothing has really changed out in the world as a result of a person doing inner work. So we have to sense these often really meaningful deep experiences people have had internally and begin to focus on how are you going to bring that out into the world and then finally the seventh step is we emphasize if you want to live a creative life it's not a one-time deal it's not one shot mm -hmm. you have to be practicing as any creative performer knows they have to be practicing every day so we set up some daily practices that will that will take what they did in the trance as a starting point mm. and see how you can live it you know in an increasing way in the everyday of your life so that's a lot yeah uh, relax uh identify uh, the key information open into trance mm. weave everything into the trance create an integration send it out into the world and practice every day wow that's why we do a 12-day certification i'm looking forward to it <laughs> yeah so you know what, what the certification is about is giving this framework mm. of generative trance we've touched upon just a few of the things and then giving this step-by-step -step method mm. that people can use on themselves or if they're they're pro professionally working with others they can use to have this disciplined flow if you will of guiding a person through the steps of creativity or what we would call the necessary conditions yeah, yeah. For, for sustainable change mm. thank you steve welcome um i really like your rapport with music rhythm repetition resonance what what could you tell us about that 
Well, I would say, I mean, I've always been interested in uh, altered states of consciousness or how to be able to have these deeper states of consciousness. It was always frustrating to me being, you know, in sort of formal school and formal education and see the hypocrisy. So I've been, I've been studying it for a long time. And I, I think you could say that trance is universal. It's in every culture you'll ever see. And when you look at uh, how you develop a trance, you see there are these shared principles. One is what, what in martial arts we call one point. So center or fo focus your eyes or traditionally, you know, you look at the watch, um, you, you have a continuous focus on one thing. The complementary principle is rhythm, rhythm, resonance, and repetition. And when you have rhythm and resonance, and the repetition, boom, 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 boom. What that does in the brain is what is called the orienting response, which is uh, always breaking rhythm. And it's how the ego mind or the conscious intellect is created by a pattern interruption. So the sense of, what do I do? Oh my God, what does that mean? Oh, 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 my, oh my God, but what if this happens? All, all of that compulsive internal dialogue that most of us know all too well, if you want to make that disappear, then you start going in these continuous rhythms. Mm -hmm. So mus musicality, yes. uh, I think, has been found to be the first language of human being. Mm -hmm. I think, um, and certainly Milton Erickson was an extraordinary model of this, mm -hmm that most that about 80 percent of the trance work is not verbal yes thank you steve and and one additional question um what would be your favorite singer if there is one <laughs> well, that changes you know uh, i know that you like music very much so <laughs> music likes me you know i always know yeah, i know that if i'm happy because i've got music you know, and all these songs, or even like when I was a teenager, it may not seem so spectacular, you know, to, to a, a full adult, but I was shocked. I always had songs going through my head when I noticed that the songs that I was thinking of were reports on my, my personal state. Mm -hmm. So something like, I can't get no satisfaction. <laughs> so it, it was really kind of interesting. Um, I'm sort of stuck in a time tunnel uh, in some ways, you know, for the music that was really precious to me when, when you know, back in the late 60s and 70s. But I'd say the great Irish uh, soul singer, Van Morrison, is probably my favorite singer. Okay. But there's a lot, you know, the thing about rock and roll is you don't have to have technically a great voice to be a great rock and roll singer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sometimes you are. I mean, I think Van Morrison has a technically a great voice, but look at somebody like Bob Dylan, mm -hmm. who, you know, I think is the most influential, yeah. the greatest American songwriter of the 20th century. Nobody even comes close. Mm -hmm. Not exactly technically the best voice. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Steve. Welcome, Ned. I know that you bring poetry a lot in your work. Could you tell us the reason why you are bringing poetry in, in this work, especially? Well, uh, I poetry has always been a very special language to me. I mean, again, when I was in high school, I started reading poetry and it was shocking. It was like, like a good poem, like any great piece of art. Mm. It touches something here and something quiets down and opens up into a, a, a deeper level of, of, a, of, a, of a beautiful world. So what we're trying to do in creativity in general 
and trance work in particular, we're trying to use words to open a space beyond words. So if I say to you, Natalie, you can relax. You say, oh yeah, I read that book too. Mm -hmm. It's not trance. Mm -hmm. we're, we're still locked inside of our verbal boxes mm -hmm. upstairs. Mm -hmm. What we're looking to do in trance work is bring language into the body so that, as I say, you really can relax. All of a sudden, you see you see images of, of being in an open field of flowers, or you find yourself in a warm ocean of water, or you it, it touches something beyond the particular words. And and to be creative, we have to use language like that. The, the literal language is also really important. You know, you'd be really specific and get the details and get into action orientation. But we're using trance at these junctures in our process where we, we need to create some new space, some new understanding, some transformation, some healing in some way. We, we you know, Einstein is often quoted as saying, to solve a problem, you can't do it at the level at which it was created. Yeah. So we're, we're looking to open to something so that everything is there that was there before, but you have a much bigger space with a much deeper feeling of how you can work with it, what else you can combine with it. Poetic language and musical language, mm. that's one of their major effects. Mm. So that's that's why we, we would use it so much. Mm. Yeah. We're, we're trying to get words to move through the body mm. and out from the body and out into the world. Yeah, that's so true. Thank you, Steve. Um, I have a last question. Uh, no, I just would like to ask you another so steve uh, you bring a lot and and more and more somatic um, movement and somatic mind in your work can you give us more explanation about that why is it so important to include somatic mind because it's it's such an integral part of every thought and every experience and every, every, every moment that we're creating life in, in the world. We, we can, I think it's clearly the case that the somatic mind is first. It's the, it's the most primary and more basic. And we see this in mammals, you know, our dogs and our cats and our horses, and how, how we think about them, how we communicate with them. We see it also in children. Mm -hmm. Children are basically in their somatic mind. So um, as we mature and develop and, and developmentally unfold as humans, we get this second mind, this social cognitive verbal mind, which is a, a miracle. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't mean that we can abandon you know, really creativity, I think clearly is shown to be a balance between how you know things here and how you know things here. Was Pascal, was he a California philosopher? Gregory Bateson uh, often used to quote Pascal uh, and the English is uh, something like uh, the heart has its reasons that the head knows nothing about. So when we're working with problems or stuck places, almost always this conflict or this impasse is because one part of a person's intelligence, their somatic, for example, has a very different representation 
then another part, their, their verbal mind upstairs. That, that lack of communication, that lack of harmony is a primary cause of suffering and stuckness. So what we're looking to do is go from here to here to here to here to here to here. And, and so we're always curious about how to welcome, how to creatively activate the somatic mind, because it, it can be present, but in a very restricted way. That's anxiety, that's anger, that's, that's um, losing your temper, that's depression, that's uh, like addiction to food or alcohol. That, that that's that's somatic mind where it's being mistreated or not being welcomed into the creative conversation so just from a practical point of view we have to have a connection to what's up here what's down here and what's out here and and when the the circuit is sort of open and flowing that's when change begins to happen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wherever it's blocked, you know, the, Chi in the Chinese would call it blocked chi. We, in the West, we call it stress. Mm -hmm. uh, health suffers, yeah. a sense of well being to enjoy life. I, I enjoy being alive, I enjoy my every, uh, everything of, about life. Uh, my capacity to connect well with others, my capacity to uh, have these these creative visions, um, those those are all lost if our body is shut down or if we're, we're living in disconnection from our body. So everything depends on mind, body, community, connection. And that's what we're doing in trance is we're sort of redrawing the mind to include all that and then finding a way to safely and um, in, in some disciplined way begin to sense what is it that you want? What do we need to connect to in order to get it? How can we imagine doing that in many ways? How can we make a commitment to take action in the world? So. That's what we're trying to do in, in sustainable creativity. And, and if, you're, if you're hostile or not friends with your somatic intelligence, it's not, nothing is possible. Mm -hmm. That's true. Thank you, Steve. Um, could someone who is not a coach or psychotherapist or professional attend this training? And what precautions should be taken? Well, uh, first of all, the answer is yes. I mean, I, I've been doing Transcamp for almost 40 years in, in different forms. And uh, we have, a, we have a, a combination of different people. We've got, you know, therapists, we've got people, other types of professional people, you know, last 15 or 20 years as the coaching community has developed, probably have more coaches than anything else. And, and there are some people who are just there with a commitment to live their personal life in a, in a deep, creative, positive way. Um, of course, there are, whatever you call them, dangers. But, but one of the reasons I don't use the term hypnosis is people have these strange ideas that one false move and the person, you know, goes berserk. Uh, the 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 dangers there are no dangers unique to hypnotic work i don't think um the what we really focus on ethically and practically for anything sustainably positive to happen is connect to yourself always as your first base connect humanly to your partner always as a precondition. Anything you're saying, track it through that circuit 
and realize the most important thing is your intention to support a person and your commitment to feedback in every moment so that the technique is not coming so much from the coach. You're not trying to control somebody, but the technique is a natural emergence of what's coming out of a person's own individual sense. And, and what we work on is how to, how to be, that's why I said step one is how to get a comfortable centered state so that you can be able to go at a pace that works for you, mm -hmm. uh, that you can move in a way when you're working with your clients, with other people, that, that you can do that in a very sensitive way. Mm -hmm. One of the great things about the certification programs, as you know, um, is we have uh, a, a team of um, people who are very experienced people who are sort of guides during the course and, and people meet in small groups uh, uh, at least once a day with their team leaders. And you, you of course, run the, the team leaders. Um, uh, so, so we have these very close, small communities of people that we're making sure that everything that happens is done with human respect and human kindness. That's the only way, mm -hmm. the only real way forward. So I, I think when we have that as our main values, mm. think, think, things go very, very well. Yeah. But, and by the way, even in the work ethically, if you want to invite another person to make a change or open to something, one of the things I learned from Milton Erickson is you, you always go first as the practitioner. Yeah. So you only invite people to experience something, to do something that you're already experiencing and doing for yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that, that's the basis, I think, for all success in relationships, personal and professional. I agree. We're not focusing on the other part as our first connection, but I, I did martial arts for 28 years and this, this sense of drop into your center mm -hmm. and from there go into the wall. So your personal change, I always say you should get a lot of therapy from your clients in a way that's appropriate for for that social role but you should be deeply helped by the amazing creativity and courage that your clients are showing and so so personal development is always the first thing the first value that we have in work and then if you want to extend it to help others great mm. Thank you very much, Steve. Um, do thank you for all of these precious answers. And do, do you want to add something for, for the French people? Well, uh, Paris is my favorite city in the whole wide world. <laughs> do, you, do you say that at each time you go to a country or is it really? I don't, I don't. I, people say, what's your favorite city? And I say, well, Barcelona is, is pretty close, you know? Yeah. Uh, but I, I love Paris. I just treasure it. And, uh, yeah. you know, we're, we're hopefully at the end of this long black plague. Uh, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to being in Paris. I, I, the trans camp, the 12 day certification, I think it's the, my, the funnest thing that I do. I've, I've been doing this for over 40 years in, in different versions. It becomes such a beautiful community of people that are all supporting each other to have fun, to have deep experiences, to make creative change, both personally and professionally. And it's also with 12 days, you get, I think, a very thorough step-by-step uh, -step, um, uh, process that has each step having a lot of different technical ways to, to, to satisfy it. So you come out of this 12 day, I think 
hopefully with this great sense of personal transformation, but also with the skill level that you you can use very uh, powerfully with yeah. the people that you're working with. So I think it's great. So that's, that's why I'm very appreciative that you guys are, are sponsoring. I think this is, I don't know, maybe the sixth or seventh trans camp I've done in Paris. I, I don't know. Exactly. Jean-Luc and Jeanette will be there. But... Yeah, yeah, they will be there, of course. <laughs> yeah. so, thank you very much, Steve. Yeah, yeah. thank you, Natalie. Thank, thank you. you. I, I really look forward to seeing you. and Looking forward to do it too. Any of you in January. Thank you.